You know, one thing that we often don't consider in our lives is that God is watching us. That oftentimes we become what is called practical atheism, which is, yes, we believe there is a God. We believe that even Christ died for us, but at times we live as if God is not real as if he's not watching, if he's, as if he's not reigning. And so we don't take that into account of our lives sometimes, that we are to live for, for God. We're to live for God's glory. We're to live for Christ. And, and this is one of the things we are to take. In, 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 we don't fall into that practical atheism. Is that is one of the principles from the day, is that God is watching this verse, verse 3, comes in the midst of, it's sandwiched in verses that speak about our tongue. And along as well as the greater context is, uh, of, you know, of all the, all the sins that he is, that mentioned that we are uh, of the foolish person and how the wise person lives. That here is this verse that tells us, look at this, Proverbs 15.3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the good, evil and the good. That here God is watching. This is in between verses that speak about the tongue, and our tongue is the bee. And then you have all those verses before, and those that come after it talk about the, whether what ha, deals with how we handle our money the friendship we're to have, that how we are to treat the poor, how we are to treat other people, how, you know, and the list goes on and on. God is watching. But I want you to know that when he's saying that God is watching, he's not saying that God has eyes, like we do, where we can sit and if you're sitting on the porch, you can watch people go by and drive by, walk by your house, or you can watch your children play. You can watch sports. You can watch uh, and look at other people. But God doesn't have eyes. This is speaking of that God is, He's omnipresent. He is everywhere. And so why it's talking about the eyes of the Lord is to get us to, it's using human terms to, to help us understand that God sees everything. He's omnipresent. He is everywhere. He is in every place at all times. There is not a place that where He is not. There's not a place you can go and hide that God cannot see you. You know, people like to think that they can hide, but they can't. God sees, sees us when we're on a plane in the sky. He sees us when we're at homes. He sees us at our work. That he sees us when we go, if we're below the ground. That You know, uh, my family and I, in, in June, we went to a cavern, Ohio Caverns, that went and went through these cave systems. God is, God can see me when I'm, I forget how many feet I was below, but God can see me when I'm in there. And when they turn the lights off, and though I cannot see nothing, God can see. And so there's not a place that where God, that you can be where God is not. And so the eyes of the Lord are watching. He sees everything. This also describes God's omniscience, because if God is omnipresent and He's watching, then He is also knows everything. He possesses all knowledge. And we know that He, he is omniscient, that He's all-wise, all-knowing. But as relating here, He knows everything as He, as he sees there's nothing that I can do. Nothing I can say that he doesn't know. Whether that is in private, in secret by myself, or just between me and another person. God sees and God knows. And so his knowledge is perfect. His knowledge is holy. He knows all things. Uh, Romans 11.33 Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. 
Psalm 139, 2 through 6. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand on me, upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. God knows everything. His knowledge is perfect and unfathomable. He's an awesome God. There's a king in the Old Testament when when Elisha was alive that was going to attack the northern tribe. And Elisha kept telling the king their plan. And the king thought there was a leak as if there was a, a spy. But someone told him that it was Elijah. So they went to go get rid of Elijah, thinking that he's the problem. And God sent his angels to protect where Elisha was at. And God had blinded them, if you remember this, and led them to, to the king of Israel. And God had opened their eyes. They saw exactly where they were. God knows everything. God, it, it, the only reason Elisha knew is because God saw and, know, and knew these things. Man likes to think that God doesn't know. But God does. So this verse is speaking of God's omnipresence. And as well as that he is omniscient. But it's also describing his sovereignty. That he's governing this world, that nothing escapes his notice. He's in charge, he's on the throne. Nothing happens he does not know about. See, our earthly rulers are different. President Trump cannot know everything going on. No president knows everything going on. Not even within their own cabinet they can they know every single thing that is going on. Things can happen... That, that the president doesn't know about. And you see that people are arrested under all these different presidencies. You have people doing things, taking advantage of positions. But with God, He knows all things. Nothing can happen they does not know about. Nothing can happen without His command. God either commands it directly that, or He has allowed it to happen. So nothing can happen without him knowing about it and allowing it. It's not that he finds out about it afterwards, as we do, and as a president can or a king. It cannot happen without, apart from his sovereignty. He is in control. And so the Lord is in charge. Psalm 11, 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. He is watching. He is reigning. He is ruling. And so this proverb here, that God is watching, provides a warning and a comfort. Look at verse 3 again. The eyes of the Lord are in every every place, watching the evil and good. God is not watching as in sitting back and doing nothing. As some people like to think. They think that he is like some elderly gentleman sitting on his porch watching things happen and doing nothing about it. That idea has been around for a long time. It went by a name of deism. That where God had made this world but he steps back and does nothing and just watches as if we were watching something happen and we could not do anything about it. But God is not like that. No, God is not just watching and never responding to good or to evil because that is not a biblical picture of who God is. This is an unbiblical picture of who God is. God 
is watching is not just him sitting around doing nothing. His watching actually brings two responses. And this is where the warning and the comfort come in. That those who do and speak evil, he is going to punish. Those who say and do what is right, he will protect and reward and be with him in eternity. So the warning is the one is to those who say and do evil. Because Psalm, 9, Psalm 10 verse 4 describes their attitude. The wicked in the haughtiness of his countenance does not seek him. All his thoughts are is, there is no God. In pride. They want to think and convince themselves that God does not, is not real and he doesn't exist. And at least they, and what they're doing is wishing that to be. But that's not reality. Their pride is that, that there's no God. Then there's those who, who say and speak evil who think God does not care because they're not punished immediately is, is what they think. Psalms 10 verse 11, he says to them himself, God is forgotten. He is hidden in his face. You'll never see it. They think that if God sees it, he doesn't care. Or, maybe he didn't see it. Maybe he's really not omnipre omnipresent, omniscient. And doesn't know about it, has not seen it. That is not a biblical picture of who God is. That is not what God himself says in his word. We're actually going to see that those who think because that they have not been punished, that either God doesn't exist, or he doesn't care, or hasn't seen it, in reality... That is actually a form of punishment by God. And I'll explain in a few minutes what I mean by that. Every evil word, every evil attitude, every evil plan, every evil action, God will bring into judgment. God does punish evildoers. In God's wisdom, some evildoers are punished by severe consequences in this life. Sometimes God's punishment is handing them over to their desires to self-destruct. That is when they think God doesn't see, God doesn't care, not realizing that God has handed them over to self-destruct. Romans 1, 24-25 Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, so their bodies will be dishonored among them. For they worship, I mean, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worship and serve the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. God's handing over is a judicial act that he hands them over to their desires, that this is what they want, you're, you're, it's going to destroy you. But then he also, when he hands them over, also pushes them like they're going down a, a hill where it just gets worse and worse. And so that is actually a form of punishment to hand them over. That is probably, that, I, I, that is, we may not think of it like that, but it is an awful punishment that God to hand someone over to their sinful desires to destroy, that will destroy them. That is an awful punishment. And that is, as I said, is when people think they're getting away with things. And that is times when you are tempted to think that God, God's just allowing them to get away with it. No, He's not. No, God is not allowing them. God is, is punishing them. And so God, and then God will punish the wicked in eternity. He will bring every evil deed, every evil word, every evil thought, every evil action and plan into judgment. He will do those things. And He will even bring into punishment what some don't even think about. His idle, careless words. Matthew 20, 
uh, Matthew 12, 36 through 37. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for in the day of judgment. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. Careless words, idle words that are, things are not profitable, they're not productive, and they do not edify, they do not encourage. And he'll bring even those into judgment. Give an accounting. Because our words do reveal where we stand in eternity. Whether we are in Christ or not. And in eternity, the unsaved will stand before God in the great white throne judgment. As Revelation 20, 11-12 describes, Then I saw a great white throne, and he who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, stand before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. There's a warning. He says, the great and small, those who had power and positions and wealth and prestige, who think that they owned everything, they will be brought into account. And just as well as those who they ruled over were underneath their command. God will bring into judgment. And so this is a warning to anyone that thinks that God doesn't see, God doesn't care. He is watching, and he's not passive in his watching. Because the books will be opened. Because he is writing, in a, in a sense, writing down everything. His books, everything you've done, everything you said, be taken into account. Whether it's been said and done in public, or whether it's been said and done while no one is watching, even our thoughts. And so for those who do not know Christ, take warning, repent, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Humble yourself today. And turn from your sin and repent. Call upon Him to forgive you. Knowing that you justly deserve hell. Because for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. None of us. So call upon the Lord to have mercy upon you and to forgive you and to save you. And so there's this warning. But this verse also comforts believers. That is the comfort. Because nothing escapes God's watchfulness and His care. He knows every, each and every situation. He judges things with perfect knowledge. When I go through a trial or a hard time, God knows and sees, and it didn't escape His attention. He's able to comfort me through His Word. He's able to comfort me through the preaching of His Word. He's able to comfort me through friends and family. He knows, and He watches, and He cares. When you're tempted to sin, you have a great high priest, Jesus Christ, who you can go to mercy and grace to help. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 describes our great high priest, Jesus Christ. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So when you're tempted to sin, you can go to the throne of God. When you go through a trial, in hard times, you can go to God's throne because of Christ and because of your high priest. You can go to Him. A lot of people like to turn to different things. Food, if 
for comfort. Drugs, alcohol, shopping, pleasure, the TV, music, and all these things. We ought to turn to Christ. We can go to Him. We have access 24-7. We can go to Him anytime. And we don't have to wonder, does He care? Is he going to be, is he going to help me? And God says, he, we have one, we have this high priest. We can go to the throne. And elsewhere, speaks, we go boldly to the throne of God because, not because we're arrogant, but because of Christ has opened the way. And so we have this high priest. And then also, we can take comfort that God sees me when I obey and walk with Him. He knows all those things. He sees me when I do things in, in private, in secret, that others don't know about, that I'm doing for His glory, that I'm serving Him. But even doing it privately, He knows. knows about. He knows about... He sees you when you sin... But unlike unbelievers, you find forgiveness and grace. He sees you when you give a gentle answer or a harsh answer. He sees how you treat people. He sees you when you sin with your tongue. Or He sees you when you use your words wisely. He sees no matter what. And so you cannot hide anything from Him. But He's willing to forgive when you do sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we have a high priest who can help us when we are tempted, that we can go to and ask for help to not do those things. But when we do sin, He's faithful and righteous to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And as a believer, you, you ought to humble yourself because also we can take comfort in, in this that, you know, when someone does something hurtful to you, lies about you, slanders you, know that God sees that situation. And so you must humble yourself because you do not know everything. You cannot claim to know what someone is thinking or the motives of the heart when they do those things to you. Unless they told you exactly why. But you know who does know? It's God. The God who is watching. And so if someone does something hurtful to you, forgive them. And let God judge the situation and know everything completely. Forgiveness. Remember there is two stages to forgiveness. There's the first step, which is you forgive them in your heart. You do not grow bitter and angry and resentful and look for vengeance or to get back at them, revenge. You forgive because God has forgiven you of so much. We ought to remind ourselves of God has forgiven you of so much. I, I know that God has forgiven me of so much. And so we can forgive with God's grace and help. And the second stay, step of forgiveness is reconciliation. Where when that person does come and repent and confess their sins to you, you can tell them outwardly that you forgive them. And reconciliation is to restore them to a right, right relationship with you. That here, that they're, they that you have told them that you've forgiven them. But God knows all these things, and God's the one that can perfectly judge, and we should let Him judge the situation and punish as He sees as necessary. But we should see, want to see that person come to Christ that they are not saved. And so we ought to forgive. And so we need the Lord's help in this. And we can take comfort that He's watching, nothing escapes His notice, and He's able to help us in time of need. 
And so let us remind ourselves that not, we cannot live in practical atheism. We have to remind ourselves that God is on His throne. He is watching. He is reigning and ruling. And then also the second principle is your tongue should bring healing, not harm. Verse 4 is a soothing tongue is a tree of life, but perversion in it crushes the spirit. What is a soothing tongue? And why is a soothing tongue compared to a tree of life? Well, a soothing tongue is one that does not lie, but speaks the truth. A, sing, uh, uh, a soothing tongue is a gentle tongue. Do you remember from last week what a gentle tongue is? A gentle tongue is not wimpy. It doesn't say, I'm sorry for things I've never done. It's not cowering. It's a tongue that's bold and stands firm in the truth but it's gracious and kind at the same time. It's a, a soothing tongue edifies and encourages a person. It doesn't hurt a person to tear them down with, and, and to cut them down as that we may speak. I mean, have, have you ever had a sunburn? With a sunburn, we're looking for relief. And you apply aloe to it. And how does that feel on a sunburn? It feels good. It feels soothing. That it helps bring relief to there. And so a soothing tongue is one that brings healing. That's why it's, it's compared to a tr the tree of life. Is it, it helps, encourages, edifies, builds up, and all those things. It helps us. And so a soothing tongue speaks the truth in love. Colossians 4, 6, Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Or Ephesians 4, 29, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. So we need to be kind and gracious with our words. Words that help. Words that encourage. Words that are like aloe on a sunburn. Or even ointment on a, a cut. Or if you ever gotten burned before. If you had a really bad burn that you put on vitamin E on that, that soothes and helps. That's the way our words should be. There are things that we say that actually don't help. help. When someone hits their head, sometimes someone asks, did it help? Meaning, that did it make you smarter? That's not really helpful. Or somebody trips and falls. Some people say, have a nice trip, see you next fall. Well, those don't help someone. What, you know, what helps is encouraging. What helps is to make sure the person's okay. A soothing tongue is a tongue that also loves. Biblical love is different, much different than however the world defines love. Love to the world is tolerance and acceptance of of no matter what it is. I mean, we are, if, do you remember reading the book, The Emperor's New Clothes? That is what we're seeing right now on display. People accepting all kinds of folly. But the reality is that if you really think about it, they who claim tolerance, they cannot hold to that principle absolutely. Because they get intolerant of Christians. They show anger and hostility and hatred. Telling you at the same time, you should be tolerant and be loving. But yet they are not being tolerant themselves. Because they're intolerant of what they perceive out of you as, as hatred. No, biblical love is not that. Biblical love does not go along with anything and everything. Biblical love speaks the truth. 
A soothing tongue calls out sin so the person repents. Biblical love does not allow a believer to continue in their folly. Biblical love will go to them in kindness and in privacy at first, following that Matthew 18 principle, going privately and showing them in private their sin. That is biblical love. Biblical love proclaims the gospel to sinners. Biblical love proclaims the gospel to people that need to hear it. Biblical love speaks the truth. Even if people do not want to hear it, biblical love speaks the truth. It speaks the truth. Look at verse 4 again. It's a lying tongue that is not a tree of life. It's not soothing. Proverbs 15.4, A soothing tongue is a tree of life, but perversion in it crushes the spirit. A perverse tongue does not speak the truth, but speaks lies. It tells people they are okay when they're not. A biblical law, a bib- they, uh, I'm sorry, a perverse tongue is the tongue of a false teacher who hides the, God, the true gospel, who tells people they are okay in their sin when they're not. They lie and they have a perverse tongue and it will destroy. A perverse tongue suppresses the truth and this brings God's judgment. Romans 1, 18-19 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. Brings God's wrath and judgment. It's a, it, it harms. It doesn't help. If you remember that, as I mentioned in Emperor's New Clothes, that everybody went along with the lie. And it, and until a child spoke up. And in some of the versions, they decide just to continue on with the lie. That harms. That harms people. It, it's, it, it lies. It's a tongue that will flatter. It's a tongue that slanders. It's a tongue that praises evil. It's a tongue that condemns good. It's a tongue that blasphemes God. It's a perverse tongue that praises and speaks all kinds of evil. And it crushes. And then it also mocks. It cuts down. It belittles. It's like words can be knives. It's like stabbing someone. I mean, most of us will not stab somebody. But a tongue like this is like stabbing somebody with a knife. Repeatedly. And so this is a tongue that crushes the spirit. It is not a tree of life. It would be like, it's not like putting aloe on a sunburn. Or vitamin E on a, uh, on a burn that you got from a stove or from, from something hot. It's actually going to be Something, it's like it would actually make it worse. It would be putting gasoline on those, those burns. It would be, it, it, it speaks evil, it lies, it's a, it, it crushes. And so our words are important. And so we have to ask ourselves, so rely upon God's help and grace to have a tongue that, 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 that honors Him. Even going back to the last week, a gentle answer turns away wrath that are tongues that have gentle answers and today as well that realize that God is watching God is watching and then as well as a tongue that is like that aloe on a sunburn that we ought to help and encourage and edify and we need God's grace and we need his help each and every moment we cannot be practical atheists we have to rely upon him and we have to we need his help each and every day.